Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for coming along to our event today. And um, it's so terrific to see so many of you here. Um, my name's Anya Johnson. This is my Christmas-themed <laughs> colleague, Helen and Ewan. <laughs> Seriously not planned. We're getting into the Christmas spirit <laughs> Um, but we are bookending this session, so I'll be doing some introductions and Helena will be doing some conclusions. But really I wanted to welcome everyone here uh, from around New South Wales but also around the country. And it's terrific to have you here and terrific to be able to present this report and also give you a bit more of an overview um, of our project. So, but before we begin, I would like to acknowledge uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose lands the University of Sydney is present. And I, really, when I think about us as a university, we are the oldest university in, the, um, in Australia. We've shared knowledge there for over 150 years, but that pales into insignificance, really, when we think about the knowledge about culture, about the sea and the land that's been passed down through the generations of um, culture before us. So I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, uh, past, present and emerging. I also need to do a little housekeeping. <laughs> so I'd like to say these are your exits. We have emergency exits over there and we will be directing should we need to, so we're all good. We also have bathrooms. They are in the internal parts that you can access through that corridor just there. Uh, and also we have, as you've probably noticed, we're going to be filming this event and we have photographers. So if anybody would prefer not to appear, please do just indicate to us and we'll be looking around uh, if that is the case. And also we have social media. So if you would like to um, use your social media about the event and please use our hashtag, which is design for care. All right, so let me just start by introducing um, our first speaker. And this is Sharon Parker. So Sharon is the lead investigator for the Design for Care or the Smart Design for Care project. And Sharon is the distinguished or John Curtin Distinguished Professor of um, Organisational Behaviour and the director of the Centre for Transformative Work Design at Curtin University. Uh, she is a researcher on work design and mental health, and she's most recently been awarded the Australian Research Council Laureate Fellowship, which is our highest honour in Australia, which is fabulous. Um, she's been named top 2% of scientists in the world by Stanford University, but my personal favourite award amongst all the awards that she has is an International Mentoring Award. And that really, I think, speaks not so much to what Sharon knows, which is fantastic, but actually to how she works um, and how much she involves others, how much she inspires others and how much she really works hard to develop the generation coming through. So I'm particularly proud of that award. Um, and I guess I'll briefly also... I'd. We'll also be introducing our key speaker, which is Professor Alex Colley. And Alex um, is based in Monash. Uh, he's the director for the Healthy Working Lives Research Group and one of the co-leads in this project. And Alex, along with his team at Monash, have done the analysis on this report that you'll be hearing about today. He's a, a, a future fellow awarded by the Australian Research Council and also a Churchill Fellow. So we've got lots of fellows. <laughs> we in academia like the fellows. Uh, yes. Um, but he has a specialisation in, in personal injury compensation systems, work disability benefit, and their impact on work, social and health outcomes of injured and ill people. And like Sharon, Alex is an absolute leader in his field, and we're delighted that he's here um, to be able to present today. So please, firstly, welcome Sharon, and then we'll welcome Alex. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much, Anya and Helena. It's an absolute delight to be here this morning, um, and also to see so many of you here today. Um, when people told me how many had registered, only a third will turn up, I said. I was a bit pessimistic. But I, I can see that just about everybody's turned up. And that's a, a true um, sign, I think, of your guys' commitment to this topic. So thank you very much for coming along. My job is basically to introduce the Design for Care project and tell you a little bit about it. 
Uh, so it's designed for care. It's about work design in the care sector. So as it says here, in the healthcare and social assistance industry. And um, it is funded very generously by iCare, who had the, I think, commitment and foresight, actually, to um, call for this project a couple of years ago. It's a three-year project, um, and our focus is fundamentally on creating psychologically healthy work for the workers in that sector. And, of course, we all know that this is a vital sector. Um, in terms of the importance of the work that our aged care workers do, our disability social workers, and, and, and this is really critical work, but it's very challenging, and uh, we all know that. And so it's a, a sector that's really um, important to focus on how we can improve the quality of the working lives of the people who do that critical work. There's sort of um, two parts to our project. Um, in a nutshell, the first part is what you're going to hear about today at this, our first State of Affairs um, event. And that is really a bit of an analysis. It sort of sets the scene for the project because it looks at what research has already been done on this topic in the sector, but also deeply analyzes some workers' compensation data. So you will see that shortly. As I say, this work sets the scene for the second part of the project which is where we are actually moving towards how can we improve the quality of work. So this is a series of projects where we uh, first of all try and understand what the quality of work is, what the issues are, and then participatively redesign that work, so with the workers involved themselves, and then of course evaluate what impact that change has had. And that's the second part of the project we have some fantastic organisational partners, some of you are here today, um, <clears throat> working with us on that part. Next year we'll have some State of Affairs events that feed back some of that research and those findings. Uh, we are three university teams, we are a genuinely national team. So uh, I'm from Curtin University uh, in Western Australia and we have of course the University of Sydney and we have Monash University. So um, that's where we're going, exciting work ahead. Thank you again for being here. And uh, without further ado, I would like to pass you to Professor Alex Colley, who's going to share with you uh, some of the findings from part one of our project. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sharon, and thank you earlier, Anya, for that lovely introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and to be able to share with you the work we've been doing over the last 18 months or so, this is part of what we've been doing, um, looking at what's been happening in New South Wales in terms of psychological injury claims in the workers' compensation scheme here. And hopefully this does set the scene for a good panel discussion to follow. Um, there's a few people for me to acknowledge and thank, uh, whose names are on the, um, the slide here. Particularly, I wanted to um, acknowledge Dr. Asmari Galore, who's in the audience today, where he is? Raise your hand, Asmari, thank you. Asmari is um, responsible for a lot of the detailed analysis that you'll see today, has been in the thick of the data. Um, and if there are any tricky questions, I'll be referring them to Asmari when I'm speaking. Um, but also my other colleagues, Shannon and Luke, um, and of course the bigger team that Sharon just described across Curtin and Sydney, and all the partners who are involved in the really exciting part of this project for me is turning um, what we're doing, turning our mind towards solutions. I spend so much of my time admiring problems and it's really great to be involved in a project that's actually attempting to change the way that work is designed and run, in, particularly in this sector. Um, and why this sector? Well, I think there's probably no surprise why we're focusing on this to people in, in this audience. Um, it is the largest industry in Australia, um, by, purely by employee numbers. So, approaching 2 million people in this industry, in, in this country now, and over 500,000 people working in healthcare and social assistance industry just here in New South Wales. So it's, it's a big deal. Um, and a diversity of occupations, a diversity of settings, from an occupational health point of view, a diversity of exposures to things that might be harmful or helpful to your health and your psychological health in particular. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as I go. And clearly the... COVID pandemic has made it very clear um, that there are some mental health challenges in this 
in this sector. I'm sure many of you have been dealing with these things day to day for the last three years or more. Um, but it was already clear prior to the pandemic that there were issues for workers' psychological health. We saw the beginnings of um, trends. Again, this will be evident in the data that I show you that um, things weren't um, tracking in the right direction in terms of the psychological health of workers in this sector, and particularly in some occupations. Um, so while COVID has brought it to the fore and made it much more of a public discussion, I think there was already this sort of underlying challenge um, for the psychological health of workers in, in this industry generally. When we look at the sort of research that's been done previously, there's an enormous amount of it. And one of the things that we have done, and as Mari's also been involved in leading, is a review of all of the literature, the published research evidence globally on risk factors for psychological conditions in health and social assistance workers, particularly in workers outside of hospital settings. And I think we found 80 um, studies over the last 20 years that describe those risk factors in detail. Um, when we, and the epidemiological evidence is, is also um, pretty substantial. But what we tend to see when we look at that is the research studies look at specific occupations in specific settings at specific time periods, um, and often looking at particular sorts of mental health conditions. Um, and that's fantastic if you're trying to design a program of support for an occupation in a setting with a particular health condition. If you're trying to determine where to allocate the limited resources that we have um, across an entire industry, you kind of need to step back a little bit. Um, and that's why we chose to, for this analysis I'll show you, to look at workers' compensation claims data because it does provide an opportunity for that sort of population-based industry-wide view um, that can allow us collectively um, to examine where we can put our resources for the, for the greatest effect. The study objectives were, these are just high level objectives really to look at, uh, I'll use this term psychological injury. I'm not all that comfortable with it, but I'm gonna use it because that's the terminology that's used in, in this industry. Um, but our objectives were to compare psychological injury claims in this industry to an average of workers in all other industries at a high level, and then to look more closely within this industry at people in sort of specific occupational groupings to see if we could tease apart risk factors and outcomes and see if there were any differences. I'll only have a very brief slide on the method, don't worry, I'm not gonna spend 10 minutes talking to you about our methods. Um, I just think it is important that you understand what we're doing here. There's a lot of detail in the report if people would care to look at that. Um, this is a retrospective study. So we're looking back at nine years of data up to the middle of June last year. So we've got the first sort of 18 months of the pandemic included in our time series. We're looking at the state of New South Wales and essentially we're looking at every psychological injury claim made in this industry over that nine year period and we're comparing that to 20% random sample of people in all other industries. The outcomes I will talk about are things such as claims, so how many people make claims, the incidence of those and the proportion of people making psychological injury claims as a function of all of the claims that are made. We'll talk a little bit about injury, so the types of psychological conditions people are reporting and the mechanism or causes of those. And also I'm gonna focus a little bit on time loss, how long people are taking off work when they make a psychological injury claim and what's the total burden of that in groups of people and we'll report that in um, working years. How many working years are we losing um, to psychological injury in, in this and um, it's pretty high. Um, the nine year period for those outcomes, we're looking from middle of 2012 up to middle of last year, June 2021, for all of these outcomes. When we record time loss, we have to allow a bit of time to follow people once they've made their claim. So actually for that, we just look at a seven year period and then follow people for two years to count how long they're off work. That's it for the methods. Um, any questions I can take afterwards? Um, so let's briefly talk about the whole of industry to begin with. So what's happening when we look at the healthcare and social assistance industry compared to an average of all of the other industries in New South Wales combined. Uh, the first message is that psychological injuries make up a proportion of all of the workers' compensation claims in the sector, and it's a high, much higher proportion than what we see in other industries. It's um, about 9.5% of all of the claims over this time period, um, compared to about 5.5%. Um, so there's some interesting um, findings in that slide alone. I won't spend much time talking about it, but still, one of the messages here, and I think you will all understand why, 
um, we see this, is that it's actually relatively difficult to make a psychological injury claim in a workers' compensation setting. We know that what we're dealing with here is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, the barrier to entry for a workers' comp scheme for a person with a mental health condition is a bit higher than it is for physical injuries and conditions on average. That's not just the case here in New South Wales. That's also the case in other states and territories in Australia. But one message here is despite that, we still see about uh, a much higher proportion of claims in this industry. And one important statistic to keep in mind is that we're dealing with nearly 11,000 cases pretty much for the rest of the analysis that I'm going to show you. It's got 11,000 people in it. Um, I won't talk much about other injuries and diseases. That's not the point of today. Um, when we look to see what's happening over time, this is where things start to get a bit more interesting. So yes, on average, there's a higher proportion of claims in the health and social care industry, but it has been growing and it's been growing at a much faster rate than what we see in those other industries over that nine year time period. Um, so the blue line on this slide is um, the percentage of all of the claims um, in, in the health and social care industry that are for psychological injuries and the red line is the average of all other industries. And it's, it's more than doubled over the nine years in the health and social care industry. It hasn't quite grown that quickly um, in other industries and it was starting off a higher base. Um, and so as you can see towards the end of our time series to June last year, we're getting up to about 13.5% of all of the claims in this industry um, being for psychological injury. Um, and there does seem to be in some of the data I'll show you where we're looking at time, sort of something, some sort of inflection point around about 2015, which might be an interesting topic for the panel to discuss later on. So messages so far, higher number of claims and it's growing more quickly in this industry than in others. This is the same data just expressed as a rate or an incidence. So it's the number of claims um, per thousand workers in the sector. And if we look at it that way, that kind of standardises the comparisons that we're making between healthcare and social assistance and, and other industries. Same message, but the rate of growth sort of looks like it's even more accelerated in the healthcare and social industry, social care industry than in others. Um, and you know, we're going from 1.8 claims per thousand workers at the beginning of this time series through to more than double that at the end. We don't have data for the most recent year, but the trends over the last few years are definitely heading in a direction that we'd prefer to see um, slowing down or, or going in the other direction. Now, when we talk about the type or the, the uh, what sorts of um, psychological conditions people are making claims for, we actually don't see much difference between this industry and others at a whole. When we look at individual occupations, I'll, I'll, I'll show you some differences and that are important. But typically what we see in this industry is about two thirds of the claims are for stress and anxiety related conditions. About 20%, one in every five are for depressive disorders and about 10% are for post-traumatic stress disorders and there's a smattering of others. That's pretty consistently what we see at industry level across most industries. One of the limitations of the information we have in workers' compensation schemes is actually this is not diagnoses, it's sort of what's recorded on the claim form. And so really digging into the detail of the experience of people who are making claims is something that um, is beyond our analysis of the workers' compensation data. We can talk about general categories, but that's about the extent of detail that we have. And we need other forms of data to really inform what's happening um, within, within, this work, within these workplaces. Uh, if we look at causes, there are some differences. So the top most common causes in the healthcare and social assist industry, no surprise to you all, will be harassment and bullying, workplace pressure, and interestingly, where we see the difference is the third most common cause in this industry is occupational violence, which is something we've known about for quite a while. Uh, if we look in other industries, the top two are sort of the same, but the third one is, is different. Um, it's other mental stress factors. So the real difference here is we see a much higher proportion of psychological injury claims due to occupational violence in healthcare and social assistance than we do in, in other industries. But it's certainly not the number one. The number one are things to do with the pressure at work um, and relationships with co-workers and relationships with other members of the public, I guess, and patients or clients. Now this is where we start to see some really significant differences when we're talking about psychological injury claims is we look at how long people are spending off work. Um, the easy way to interpret this plot is that 
is it's a box called a box and whisker plot. We're presenting the median duration of time, which is this line in the middle of the coloured box. So what this tells us is that 50% of workers with a psychological injury take at least 13 weeks off work when they have a when they have a psychological injury claim. So that's about three months. If we look at other injuries, that figure is two weeks. So there's a dramatic difference. People take much longer off work when they have a, a psychological condition. And 25% of people, when they have a psychological injury claim, are taking 43 weeks off work. Now, almost, we're getting sort of pushing towards a full year there, compared to about 8.9 weeks for, for people with other injuries. So this is where we really see the big differences between psychological injury and other injuries is the, the length of time that people spend off work. And we've known this for a long time, really just showing that this effect also occurs in, in this industry. When we put those sorts of things together to talk about the total burden of working time lost in this industry due to psychological conditions versus others, what we can see is that although it only makes up 9.5% um, of all of the claims in the industry, if you count all of the time lost to all workers' comp claims, 25% of it is for people making psychological injury claims. And that's because that average duration is so much longer. That's equivalent to 3,500 lost years of work. So that's, that's like having 3,500 workers out of the workforce for an entire year, full time. So that's what we're losing just to psychological injury claims just in New South Wales in this particular study. Um, and because our rate of claims is growing, and as I'll show you, the duration of time off work is growing, that statistic is getting worse. It's, gonna, it's becoming a much greater proportion of all of the time loss in the industry over time, compared to what we see in other industries where it's still quite significant, but it's less. Okay, so we'll just briefly touch on some specific occupations. Um, we wanted to dig into detail into some occupational groupings. These are the groups we're going to talk about. Um, we chose these for a variety of reasons, um, partly because they allow, there was enough uh, data in the data set to allow us to look at them, um, but also because they're kind of logically grouped into settings and, and, and uh, categories of professions. Um, there is some material on your tables, I think, that describes some of the high-level results in some of these occupational groups that I encourage you to have a look at as well. Um, Again, I'll just take you quickly through some of these. The percentage of all of the claims per occupation, what we see here is that we see quite um, big differences in all of, the, all of the workers' compensation claims that are made depending on which occupation you're in. Actually, the highest proportion is in administrators and managers, but for all of the occupational groups we look at here, they're all above the average of other industries. And there are some that are above the average of what we see in the um, healthcare and social care industry, which are these ones here, ambulance officers, social care workers, other healthcare workers and administrators and managers. If we look at the growth in claims, we see um, again um, that um, there is a general growth um, over the course of this time series in these occupations. It's much more dramatic in some than in others. The pink line here is uh, nurses. Um, where the frequency or the number of claims has, has risen pretty dramatically, and we've seen slower, more gradual growth in some of the other occupations. The table on the right of this slide just compares the first three years of our time series to the second three years and talks about the percentage of growth that we're seeing, and it's pretty dramatic. In some of these, we're seeing over 100% growth over a nine-year time period in terms of the number of claims. This is a similar slide to what I showed earlier, looking at duration. These are those box and whisker plots. And again, we see some quite substantial variation in the amount of time people take off work, depending on which occupation they're in. The group with the longest period of time off work as a median is ambulance officers. So if, what this is telling us is that 50% of ambulance officers who have a psychological injury claim have at least 31 weeks off work, um, but it's longer. Uh, on average, these are, these are quite long median durations compared to what we see for any other claims that are not psychological injury. Um, we can read some detail into this. So if we look at this blue bar, which is social care workers, we can see that 25%, which is this line here, of people who make psychological injury claims in that, um, in that uh, occupation are taking 60 weeks off work or more, more than a year off work. So, very long durations, it varies a bit between occupation. Um, if we look at the growth in that duration of time loss, which is what this is talking about, we've seen, um, although that previous slide was sort of summarising the averages, 
This is what's been happening from the start of our time series towards the end. And you can just see some of the pretty dramatic growth. The median has gone from, for instance, in ambulance offices from 12 weeks up to nearly 40 weeks. We've seen pretty substantial growth in all of these occupational categories, some more than others. Um, people working as in aged care and disability care, the median has gone from 8.6 weeks up to nearly 23 weeks as a median. So it's all going in that, in that same direction. Okay, and final slide of data is we look at, this is just showing, it's a bit small, I apologise for that, looking at the, what we call the burden of work disability or the total amount of time loss to psychological injury claims in each of those occupational groups. I'll just walk over here so I can read it, my eyesight's not that good. Um, and really what I wanted to show you here, that statistic I talked about before was 25% across the industry in terms of all of the time loss to um, workers' compensation claims, 25% of that was due to psychological injury. In some of these occupations, it's much higher. So it's 44% in people working in managerial and administrative positions in this, in this industry. It's 39 or 38.8% in ambulance offices. Uh, it's you know, a third of all of the time loss, if you like, in social workers. And it's a bit less in some other, some other groups. And the statistic at the bottom here, which is hard to read, is the number of weeks lost in each of those occupational groups. So if we look at nurses and midwives, Although it accounts for 18% of all of the time lost, that's still 36,899 working weeks lost, um, which is about 900 people um, lost to that, to that job for a full working year. Um, so pretty substantial burden of time loss. Probably don't have much time to talk about risk factors. We've also done a review of risk factors, which is published on the study website, where we looked at the things that... Um, lead to or contribute to these sorts of conditions. Really what I wanted you to, to, to focus on, uh, the, 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 the words in bold here are the things that came through most commonly. And they're obviously things to do with the way jobs are designed, um, which is why the rest of this project is so exciting, because changing those job design and the work design has so much potential. So things like job demand, low levels of job control and low job satisfaction, they're the sort of things that the research evidence tells us most commonly. Um, uh, lead to or contribute to psychological illness in, in health and social care workers. So one slide of conclusions to wrap up for me. Um, so I think the trends are pretty obvious. Um, we can say that um, psychological injury claims in, the, in this sector in New South Wales in our time series, um, there's a higher prevalence uh, in this industry than other industries and they're growing more quickly. Um, there's a growth in claims frequency. What we're seeing is some occupation-specific patterns. Um, so it's not a one-size-fits-all approach, and our approach to intervention, uh, to prevention and rehabilitation should equally not be a one-size-fits-all sort of approach. We need responses that are tailored at the organisational and workplace level um, to really make a difference in some of these occupations. And so much of what we see when we're talking about occupational mental health um, is sort of presumed to be able to be applied across different occupations, different workplaces, different organisational settings. And clearly this is telling us that the types of conditions, the rate of growth, the frequency, the, the time off work, a lot of those things that characterise psychological injury claims in this sector vary by the type of job that you're in. And so we need equally tailored solutions, I think. Um, there's lots of risk factors. We've seen a pretty dramatic growth in how, how long people are taking off work when they are injured, um, and that's associated with a very significant burden of disability is the term that we're using for this. So we're losing lots of workers to, to this industry due to mental ill health, just looking at psychological injury claims that have resulted in workers' compensation schemes. Remember, we're not talking about other effects of mental health on things like sick leave and other things here. This is just those that have resulted in uh, workers' compensation claims. So our conclusion is that we really need to focus on prevention and early intervention in this industry, not, not surprising, to minimise both the frequency and the disability associated with these things. Um, I'll leave it there, and I think I'm out of time anyway, and we'll hand back to Sharon. Thank you so much, Alex. I'm sure you will agree that was absolutely fascinating data. Uh, um, 
worrying, of course, as well, that statistic of 170,000 working weeks lost due to psychological claims. That's huge. So I'd like um, to invite now our panel uh, to come and give some responses to the report. So I'll just briefly introduce the members of our panel. Uh, first of all, um, we have Lucinda Brodkin, AM, who sort of needs no introduction, but just in case you haven't met Lucinda, come and join us up here, Lucinda. Um, she is a real leader in this space of mental health and suicide um, prevention. And until quite recently, she was the chair and commissioner of the National Mental Health Commission and chair of the Mentally Healthy Workplace Alliance and other things, <laughs> lots here. Um, but she's still doing plenty. She's the uh, chair of the Diabetes uh, Australia Research, a director of Australian Unity, a patron of Sydney Women's Fund and national patron of Every Mind's Mind Together program, empowering and supporting family, friends and caregivers. Um, and Lucy has just got a huge commitment to building strong communities. And I have to say, one of the things I've always admired about Lucy is her commitment to using evidence in this space. Um, and so, welcome, Thank Lucinda. You, up I'd like to invite um, Suzanne Becker, although she says call her Sue, um, <laughs> who is the CEO of Lifestart, which supports children and young people with disability or developmental delay, their families and carers. She has had four decades in the disability and community service sector. Go around. She, she also, like Lucy, does about a million things, um, <laughs> sits on lots of advisory committees in the disability sector at a state and national level and has served on NGO boards. Um, I think this is really important. She was a founding member of the National Disability Services National Workforce Committee. Um, she is passionate about an inclusive community which recognises diversity and really supports the uniqueness of individuals living the best lives that they can live. So welcome, Susan. I'm looking forward to hearing from you a bit later. <laughs> and last but definitely not least, I'd like to invite Brad uh, Wakeling, who is the National Work Health and Safety Manager for Regis Aged Care. Um, Brad has a, a diverse background but really um, firmly located in the space of injury management and work health and safety for more than 20 years. He doesn't look that old, does he? But um, <laughs> apparently it's true. Um, he's had many roles in public health and aged care, worked in the regulation environment as a work safe inspector and in the compensation insurance scheme and also as a work health and safety consultant. So he brings a real commitment and passion around the health and safety of, of workers and supporting them uh, and their well-being. So this is our wonderful panel member, and I think, Alex, is you're going to come back and join us. Um, I'd just like to ask, um, and, and you will have some opportunity to ask questions of the panel uh, a little bit later, but I'd like to ask, first of all, our panel to just reflect on the findings that you've just seen. Any uh, surprises? Was it what you expected? Uh, so I'll start with you, Lucy, if that's OK. <laughs> Look, I think um, it's a great report and I love the work that Alex and his team do in really getting into the data to tell a story. Um, I've never been comfortable with numbers. I've had to work to get comfortable with data, but I am there. And I think data does tell that great story. I think one of the things that was a real gasp moment for me just a couple of minutes ago was when you look at those big numbers, there's almost a workforce in itself sitting there that we're losing. And, you know, we were, Brad and I were talking earlier, we're both involved in this sector and the, the war for talent is, is brutal. You know, we are churning a thousand people a month in some of this sector in our organisation. So to see that that sitting there suffering is... Um, really quite distressing, but a, a great opportunity, I think, that we need to, to be thinking about creatively addressing. Mm. Great. Mm. Thank you. Sue? I, too, agree with the outcome. Can you hear me OK? Yep. The outcomes of the research, and thanks to Alex and the team involved. And I think one of the critical things here is that we work in caring professions, and the impact of psychological injury in a workforce that is already really struggling just to recruit people, to attract people, to keep people, 
is really startling. And I think the next part of... I'm very interested to hear what the next part of the research work will be to see what sort of intervention strategies can be developed and implemented to sustain the workforce and keep a really valued set of people who make a remarkable difference in people's lives. And I think one of the things that's come out of COVID has been the valuing of the health and community assistance workforce. When you look at people's trust in community, trust in professions, trust in people's work, they're the out they've been the outstanding ones. So I think we have an obligation to see what can we do. Thank you. And Brett? I'll, look, I think for me the, the biggest challenge is the, the comment that Alex made around the limitations of the fact that this is only talking about the data that we can see, so mm. only the claims that get made. And we know that there's, there's way more under the, under the surface. And when you think about the people that work in our organisations, they are empathetic by their very nature. So for them to get to a stage where they have to put their hand up and say, I've reached my tipping point, now I want to go into a claim and have significant time off away from a job that they clearly are attracted to because of their sense of service for others means that it's, it's no surprise that it takes so long to get them back. Um, and I also think that the challenge around just the, the logistical return to work process is that when the, the stress is everywhere in our business, it's hard to locate someone in a safe space that they're not going to get exposed mm. or re-aggravated mm. mm -hmm. because if I think about a, a national aged care environment, if I've got a carer, I, I could put them in 64 different homes, but they're going to be exposed to exactly the same thing. <laughs> and so that's the challenge around, around um, the design because we, can't, we, we don't have safe havens necessarily. And the other thing that I, I suppose was a bit striking was that in conversations that we've had internally in our business is the challenge of the devil we know versus the devil we don't. And, and we all can appreciate that occupational violence makes up 50% or greater than our um, mechanism of injury every month, but it's, it's the bullying and harassment and, and the other um, challenges that we're almost, because of the, re the cr recruitment and retention problems, almost gets let go sometimes. At the moment, over the last two or three years, anecdotally, our managers are saying, I don't have the performance management conversations. I don't have those challenging conversations because I can't afford to lose them. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather have someone with poor behaviour in my business than no one in my business. And what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Longer term to the culture when they're exposed mm -hmm. from different angles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great reflections. Alex, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, well... They're fantastic insights. Um, a couple of things. One is, I'm glad you picked up on the, our attempts to sort of express the data in a more meaningful way. So um, the reason we've tried to express that there's a number of workers lost for a year and those sorts of things is to sort of describe that picture that it is a workforce. It's sort of the, the, loss, the opportunity that we have, I think, is if we can do things better, is to get that workforce back. Um, so we were trying hard to present it in that way. Um, and I guess just to pick up on some of the other comments made, a lot of the work that I do is about return to work and I think one of Brad's points is really critical. Usually what we attempt to do in returning someone to work is uh, remove them from the situations that cause the, the injury or disease or illness in the first place and that's when they're systemic, that's pretty hard to do. Um, so that's why I'm excited about what's going on in the rest of the project because actually it's about changing those situations. It is about sort of systemic change in workplaces. And I think that's really the only sustainable solution to this is to work with organisations to improve work design. Mm -hmm. um, in this. Th thanks so much, Alex. And I'll, I'll just sort of lead on from that. One of the, the key findings, um, as, as you just noted there, Alex, was that things like job pressure, harassment are some of the main causes. Also trauma. It's a bit hard to um, do so much about trauma. It's perhaps a little bit part of the job. But job pressure, harassment are things that we can uh, address. So can I ask you on the ground, what do you observe? Do you observe these as challenges? Um, do you see uh, uh, some initiatives being introduced to address them? I, that's a really good question. And I see the challenges 
I'm going to come back to the disability space here. Mm -hmm. And as people are aware, the, with, the, with the implementation of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, there's been a whole lot of changes in how we provide services for people living with disability or mm -hmm. delay. And that has increased the pressures on the workforce. And the turnover, I think, I have to ask my expert over there in the corner. Helen, you knew I was going to ask you this question. No, she didn't. I think uh, <laughs> the turnover at the moment is, and there's NDS people here too, up the front, is running at around 20-something percent for direct care workers, 25 percent. And it is that is high. So you think of 25 percent. And you've also, as well as running with this, we work in a very highly feminised workforce. And... We have a young workforce and um, we, at any point in time, we in Lifestart, for example, we might have 20 people off on parental leave. Mm -hmm. And with the push for men to participate in parental leave as well, that's going to have the scarce um, male workers in our workforce will have an impact on that as well. So they're running those two things together create a lot of pressure. You've got pressure on teams, you might be down in a team. And it was interesting about, the, I think, the work that Alex referred to before about the workforce pressures. And that comes out in, in a team working in a given environment as well, whether it's a residential care setting, a day program, an aged care setting. And that's that concept of not letting the team down and putting mm. more pressure on co-workers. Mm. So that is a really critical thing too, to think about. Thank you, Sue. Can I um, turn to you, Lucy, um, obviously with your very broad sector knowledge. Are you seeing um, other sectors or other pockets um, across Australia addressing these um, work design issues and getting some of that systemic change, I guess, that Alex mentioned? I'd like to say yes. <laughs> and, and I think it's a, it's a small yes, not an emphatic yes. We're seeing pockets of it yep. happening. Um, and I think it's often coming off the back of, of the data. You know, I used to think the moral obligation would be sufficient. Then I was you know, young and naive. Then I thought you know, the stick might do something. But I'm still intrigued at how few um, senior leaders in this country appreciate their obligations around psychological risk. Um, so that, that's been a real uh, gap. But I think you know, the work that, that you've been doing, that Anya and <laughs> Helena led, you know, 2014, with saying job and work design. We just can't say it enough. And what I think we're seeing now is actually little pockets within organisations saying, oh, too bad if management won't do it. We can do something ourselves mm. and we will. Mm. And that's where it's quite innovative to see what they're doing. Mm. How are we going to work as a team? If our organisation mm. can't get their act together, we certainly can. Thank you. Brad, I'll ask the same question of you. What are you observing that's out there that's working or... That, or if not, um, what do you think needs to be done to sort of move towards solutions in this space? Yeah, well, once you can find someone that's, that's cracked the, the, the Da Vinci Code, <laughs> let me know, because we'll <laughs> take them out for lunch. But I think, <laughs> I think the, challenge, the challenge for us in, in an aged care setting is uh, similar to what I faced when I was working in public health. As restrictive practice um, guidance changes, and we move away from seclusion and <laughs> restraints and, um, and even in, a, in an aged care setting, the restrictive practice changes the way that you care for the, the clientele in your business. Sometimes that can be seen as, as a competing priority to health and safety. Mm. And, what's, mm -hmm. and if I put my regulator hat back on, I think back to when I was an inspector, we had no idea as the regulator, we had no concept of what was actually happening in a hospital or in an aged care environment when it came to occupational violence and aggression. It was just another risk factor yep. that just you could control through the hierarchy of control. Is it, well, what's, the, what's the problem, guys? <laughs> like, how, how can you get people punched in the face at work? How can you have people strangled by an 80-year-old client? Mm. Like, it doesn't, that doesn't make sense. So... The challenge is to the regulators, but also to the to the executive and the management who are looking at it from a very binary perspective and and saying, okay, well, we we can have both. We we can follow um, and provide um, quality care, but it also needs to to be that design principle. So we need to design spaces better um, 
and we're doing a lot of work with Demetra Australia, partic mm. particularly for our cognitively impaired areas or wings, trying to, trying to understand what it looks like to, to change the physical environment. And we're mm. seeing it uh, a bit like Lucy, we're seeing it in pockets. We see homes taking their own initiative. So we've got a home in Hornsby here that has for their uh, memory support unit, their uh, front doors of their bedrooms are covered in a massive life-size photo of the resident in their 40s. So they can, they can identify where their room is and yep. recognise themselves. And we've got another home that overnight, they wear their pyjamas. No uniforms, they just wear their pyjamas. Mm. And it's mm. little, little initiatives mm. like that that we're stealing the magic and mm. saying, hey, this is working, let's roll this out nationally. And so don't ask me why, but one of our life care teams actually had a bundle of Regis dressing gowns. And we found that out and then we've sent, <laughs> sent that out to everyone to say, hey, wear some dressing gowns overnight if you like. But again, little, little initiatives that can start somewhere and, and get bigger. And we're just, we're encouraging and promoting those kind of thought processes within our business because I think the people at the front line have so many great ideas that we mm. need, to, need to farm and start spreading. And this is a key to it really, isn't it? It's the involvement of the workforce in mm -hmm. the solution generation because there's pyjamas idea, it's probably not the pyjamas, it's the fact that it's their idea and mm. they come up with it and they own it. And um, so the, the, the role of the worker in addressing this problem. Do any of the panel have any thoughts or comments on this process of getting workers involved in solving some of these challenges? You go first. I was going to say, I think co-design is absolutely imperative in yep. all of this. Asking people what they would like, what would they see as improvements in their workplace. Yep. And listening, I think listening is probably the imperative here. Yep. And how do, you implement, how do you implement what you're hearing and how do you make sure that it is actually meeting what people are talking about. How do you test it? How do you get people engaged and to go with you? There's no point in, um, I think the years of imposing ideas are mm -hmm. long gone and we see that reflected in what we're hearing now about the workforce. Yeah. Mm. And if we're a human services sector, we need to listen to people. People on the ground know what, if you're looking at a person-centred approach, they know what needs, what do people want? What mm. do people want that they're supporting? what works mm. and also I think not being scared of failure I think it's absolutely important to try as much as you can and it's mm. okay to fail in some mm. things and you take the learnings from that mm. but to a greater extent we we've also had some success with engaging our consumers and mm. having, yeah yep and having our clients or our residents involved in our mm. health and safety committees mm. so we encourage all our homes to say bring a resident along or this month we're doing a hazard check outside so yep. where are the green thumbs in your home that spend all their time out in the garden? Bring them along and get their perspective. And mm. I think once mm. we can start tapping into the workers and yeah. our participants, that's where, that's where the different perspective mm. comes in. That, oh, we haven't actually sat in their, sat in their mm. chair. And so I think that thing about, when I talk about co-design, it's involving everyone. Mm the people that support people, the people that are receiving services, everyone's got to be, and sometimes a wider community as well. I think it can feel a bit tricky because this is a heavy, heavily regulated sector, um, you know, to the point of almost ridiculous. There's more regulations on how to account for an aged care bed than there are around quality of care. And so we've got a misplaced space there. But in a regulated space, I think people err more to a consultation model, yes. which is the consultold model, mm -hmm. rather than getting comfortable with the co-design. Yeah. So what if we go into the garden and people, we rely on residents' feedback and then we're in trouble because that, that wasn't seen as robust enough or meeting requirements. So I think we have to try and find that way of working with the regulators to come up with models of design that, that actually work or, or make it fit the model. But this is the challenging part because often we'll say to the regulators, this is what we're thinking. And unless they're prepared to sign off, board will say, we're not compliant, is that compliant? And so you, you get in this cycle of bureaucracy that mm -hmm. just 
means that we become incredibly risk averse yeah. and that's not a good care model. There's a great and irony there, yeah. isn't yeah. there? Yeah. Yeah. Picking up on the risk averse and the paperwork, I know in the disability space, I cannot believe the amount of paper, and I get it from, you put your old hat on, <laughs> get it, you've got to show documents, prove what you've done, where you've been. But some, with the staff we talk to talk about the huge increase in paperwork and they do find that stressful, and especially if the person in charge or their supervisor or whatever, why didn't you fill that particular form in? You're going to end up in court. So there's this constant fear about have I, in my interactions with my clients, um, have I done the right thing? Have I recorded everything? People go home and they think about it. And it, people will tell you they've thought about it in the middle of the night. Mm. And those sorts of added pressures. And I often, I've often had conversations with people in the NDIA that we're not talking here about widgets. We're talking about mm. people. We're not talking just about inputs and outputs. We're talking about outcomes and what, what are the, what's the impact of those mm. outcomes being achieved. Mm. And I think... If we can't get that right in the human services sector, who's going to get it right? Okay. On that note, I'd like to open the conversation up to the floor. So if anyone has a question, please jump right in. I was really interested in the administrators and managers' data that they were the highest claimants. And I wonder, particularly, I think for managers, often they are constrained by from above, and I know that there are huge resource implications, so I can see that why that happens, but higher level executives, I'd never thought, because certainly in a tertiary hospital, at least the one I'm in, and in a fair number of places, there's a complete lack of compassion from higher level administrators, and there's very much, as we were talking about before, the sort of I it rather than the I you and relationship and I just now I'm wondering is that because they're burned out and they've lost that and without that piece of work to improve their well-being it can't flow down through the organisation because there's always a mismatch between the health workforce, the frontline workers, the managers of them and the executive. There's always a huge mismatch. So that's a great question to pose to the panel. Before we go, can you just share who you are? And oh, my name's Emily I Hibbert. Um, I'm a, an <laughs> academic with um, University of Sydney at Faculty of Medicine and Health, and I'm an endocrinologist. Thank yep. you so much. Mm -hmm. Alex, do you want to begin that um, yeah. challenging question? So great observation, um, and fantastic that endocrinologist is interested in Workplace health, that's good. Uh, maybe we'll convert you to occupational health. You know. <laughs> um, well, fair to say we were a bit surprised when we saw that as well. Um, but thinking about it more, I think we just heard a description of why, um, why some of those things are occurring in, in the claims data. There's probably a different sort of pressures amongst people in those jobs in the health and social care sector, not at the front line as much, but they still have very demanding roles uh, and you describe some of those pressures yourself. So um, I think there's, again, it's one of the reasons we wanted to tease apart the occupational groups to try to understand and see what some of the potential approaches to intervening or preventing these conditions might be. And we probably need a different approach in people in, who are in sort of managerial and executive positions than we do in mm. workers who are dealing direct, more directly with clients or patients. So I'd be keen to know what others because think they, they might be. Create or permit the culture mm. of the organisation, so it's there mm. in the plan. Yeah, that's right. Well, I think um, there's some in there is some data around the fact that actually more senior people know how to access claim. Mm. So you've actually got uh -huh. a, a level <laughs> of, of capacity to, to go on to claim to manage claim, yeah. etc. You know, you've got a GP that can help you facilitate that process. Yeah. You know, we can't assume that some of our workers in other roles actually have that relationship to, to start the process. So I think there, there's some issues there. But in endocrinology, there's some important elements we need to bring in around cortisol and, and endocrinological responses to these stresses. So um, yes, stay with the party. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments from the panel before oh, we move on? We've, we've just recently done a SWOT analysis on, on a cohort of our uh, general managers and our regional general managers to, to take a bit of a pulse check to work out what 2023 interventions look like over and above our are you okay morning teas and some kind of fruit baskets on tables um, and what we found was that there's a level of ownership that 
the managers struggle to let go of mm. when they go home. And so a general manager will feel like they're on call 24 seven. Uh, they won't have a weekend off. They're, they're petrified that the commission's gonna turn up whenever, whenever mm. they, they feel like it. And they also have a sense of burden where they don't wanna necessarily let other people come in to help almost in case they've been hiding things and someone will find out that they haven't been, it's not all shiny and, and perfect. And so the, the on-call system doesn't work necessarily for some of our, our managers and, and they'll, they'll be answering the phone at a barbecue on a Saturday afternoon mm. um, or they don't feel like they can ask for help for their direct supervisor as well. So their regional general manager won't necessarily understand even though most of our regional general managers have come from that, that chair themselves. So it's really about us trying to encourage them to let go a little bit and to access the support that's around, whether that's internally at the, in the business or externally through our EAP provider who has got a service mm -hmm. dedicated to managers to be able to have a sounding board to say, if you are having a performance management conversation, call this, call mm -hmm. this service and they will bounce ideas off you. If you are struggling as a manager, all these type of things, but they, they hold on tight until they break mm. and then they leave. Thank you. Um, let's, uh, we have another question up the back. Hi, um, yes, I'm Jennifer Pollock from iCare. I'm also currently studying wellbeing in workers in residential aged care. So my question may be a little academic and maybe I'm asking for help as well. <laughs> but looking at the health literacy and the level of health literacies in the health um, sector, Wondering, first of all, if that has an impact on the figures that we're seeing and maybe the difference between healthcare and other industries. But also, secondly, how might we harness that and harness that knowledge to improve the well-being and satisfaction in, in workers in residential and disability care? Thank you. Yeah. Lucy, let's um, <laughs> go to you. I'm giving you all the hard ones, <laughs> aren't I? <laughs> well, you know, it, it's, it's interesting... Um, we did some work around seclusion and restraint with Nicholas Proctor out of South Australia, and, and he's a professor in the nursing school down there. And he said, um, you know, what he's struck by in the seclusion and restraint practice is the distress that's caused for people because they don't like the professionals they've become um, through their burnout. And actually, there's an element of that awareness that can be distressing for them. So I, I think there may be something there. It is interesting that the tension that is created by literacy you know, sometimes you can know too much for your own good and sometimes you don't know enough. So I think that needs, says that we need to build more compassionate care models for workers to be able to recognise and hold that space of distress, psychological distress. It did get a lot of overuse, the term moral injury, during the Banking Royal Commission, but it has to be something that's at play in this space when you cognitively and emotionally have responses to your workplace and you have no capacity to, to manage those in a way that's going to, to relieve, give you any sense of relief. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We might sneak in one more question, maybe two. Uh, so we'll go to here. Hi, I'm Tatiana, um, and I'm from JK Corporate Resourcing. We're a rehab provider. And I guess a couple of questions. Great research. Will you be, in the research, were you looking just at primary psych claims or was it mm. secondary as well? And were you picking up any of the physical ones that typically are coming through as physical only, but the psych is the component that's holding them back from going back to work? Yeah, uh, really very important question. We were just looking at primary psychological condition claims here, recognising that many people who make claims for physical injury also have pre-existing or concurrent psychological health conditions that do complicate their recovery, and we've, publi we've published other research using other data sources that sort of explores how common those so-called secondary or comorbid psychological conditions are, and they're very common. So that's why I was trying to emphasise that this view is probably just the tip of the iceberg, even with that there's still thousands of workers we're losing. And um, if we were to take those things into consideration and then people who are taking sick leave or leaving the industry, yep. that's it's clearly an enormous problem. Yeah, because what we also see, even at, from executive level all the way down, that you'll see the, um, the psychological component, which isn't necessarily even a claim, is the thing that's holding them back. Yeah, that's right. So We do get some hints at that from other data sources. The claims data rarely records things other than the primary, the reason for making the claim. 
um, but we can see it in other information sources that they they have a, bit, a massive impact on both people leaving and making a claim in the first place, and then certainly how long it takes people to return to the, the workplace. Thank you. And Brad, I'll speak to you later. We've actually just run a pilot in Queensland that's specifically looking at this in aged care where we saw a reduction down to zero in off violence during the pilot. So there are things that can be done, but it's the cost that we have found when employers see the great results, the cost that then is involved in changing the workplace and making that happen. Mm. Thank you that so much. That cost issue, though, I was just taking... And Alex will probably go, oh, my God, she didn't do that. But if you take the 3,540 years lost and multiply that by the Absolutely. average income, th that's around $300 million of opportunity cost that we could invest into this mm. sector yeah. for life We need changing. to do that maths, actually. Yeah, properly. Yeah. Yeah. Not my maths. <laughs> yes, can, I, can I just raise one more thing on that? And it picks up around the investment in people. We talk about frontline workers, whether we're talking in health, in aged care, in disability and other community um, parts of the se and other community sectors or part of the community sector, there is often, and this is driven by government, it's driven by donors, it's driven by a community expectation that whether you're a government agency or a not-for-profit, you are expected to put most of that money into frontline work. And there's never a real mm. recognition of if you're actually using good practice and supporting those frontline workers, you've got to invest in all the things that sit behind that work, mm. whether in, in well-being, a whole range of training, learning and development. Mm. Um, systems. Systems. But a whole it, lot it can, of, it yeah. Can be simple things. Like, I, I wonder how many people in the room have gone to the staff room where most of their workers work mm. and sat in that staff room and said, is this a place I would like to come and have my break? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, guys, I think we will end on that fantastic point about the importance of investing in people. You're saying have one more. We're allowed to have one more quick question. <laughs> I'll be really quick. Um, so, yeah, Deborah Walsh from Hammond Care. Um, and you just really quickly touched on the cost there, so that's what I was actually going to bring up. So, with all your data and your, um, your research, the percentages are great. You know, and, and it's really good for us to sort of look at that percentages and it's nothing if you're not involved in the workers' compensation in an organisation that you aren't aware of. Um, but what I feel more so is focus on the cost. So how much a cost of a psychological claim versus the cost of an, in, um, a physical claim because they're the numbers that a board um, will actually take more notice of is the mm. cost and not the percentages. Mm. So, you Thank know, you. if you sort of look more into that on the data, that's something that supports us going forward mm. um, in our organisation. Yeah. Quick quick yeah. response, Alex, and then we will uh, have to wrap I agree. Dollars draw people's attention more quickly than percentages and those sorts of things. Um, it is possible to do that. So two examples. We've recently done that in the transport industry. We published a paper a couple of weeks ago which put a dollar value using a sort of an economic model on time lost to injury and illness in the, just in the transport sector in Australia, and it was multiple billions of dollars. So, um, picking up on Lucy's point, you know, 300 million would be a dramatic underestimate, I think, yep. Lucy. Um, and also last week there was a paper, the second example is last week, CEDA, the Committee yes. for Economic Development in Australia, released a paper on the current and future costs of mental health in this industry. Mm. Um, so check that one out as well. But it is possible to do it at an organisational level if you have the right information, absolutely. Mm. You know, it does grab the attention. We'll take that as a um, piece of feedback, actually, yeah. for our project more generally. So thank you so much. At this point, we need to move on. And I know people have got more questions, but uh, please come up and chat with our panel later and, and thank our um, panel for their fantastic comments. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. We would like to conclude by saying a few thank yous. Um, Anya, would you like to say a few words first and then I can do the rest? <laughs> our, our Christmas tree double act. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it takes a village. I'm so pleased that you've all come and I'm so pleased that you're interested and we hope that you help spread the word. That's what we really need to do. But an event like this isn't possible without a lot of support from a lot of people and I particularly want to thank Vivian Fauna, who's of our team, who really put this together. Um, so thank you, Vivian. And Meredith, who's come over from Curtin to, to work with her. So thank you both so much. Um, and 
Lastly, I'd really also like to thank ICARE for funding this research and for supporting our vision of how we can work within this industry. And particularly um, thank our partner, Yong Lee, um, who has been wonderfully supportive and really engaged in our project. So thank you. Uh, a few more thank yous, if you don't mind. Um, I, we would like to, on behalf of the Design for Care team, we'd like to thank you all for joining us. We think you've made an excellent decision, a very good job design decision for yourself to spend your the beginning of your work day with us. We hope that you were able to get some new and really useful insights. We would love for you to please share um, as much as possible the research and disseminate to bring back to your workplace. Uh, you could follow us on LinkedIn. Um, there's a QR code here. And we would also like to very much thank um, our very special um, panellists. So Lucy, Brad and Sue, thank you so much for sharing your reflections, your thoughtful insights to a very complex problem. Um, we're really excited to be able to have this project. We're, it's a journey. It's a long-term um, journey for us. We're in it for the long run because nothing that you, you sort of can't create big, scalable, sustainable solutions that are evidence-based overnight. As Brad said, we haven't cracked the nut yet, but we are on the way to try at least. Thank you to um, Sharon for your visionary leadership in this space. Um, and have I missed anyone else? And just thank you, everyone. I hope you've had a really wonderful um, breakfast morning and hope you enjoyed the event. Oh, yeah, sorry. The full report, the, the Monash report, you can QR code here. I'll take a, give you a minute to do that. Um, this event is also fully recorded and what we'll do is we will be uh, – uploading that onto our Design for Care website and we'll also be sending you a link direct to attendees today that you can share and disseminate with your colleagues and network. Uh, and finally, feedback. We are constantly wanting to improve and do better. If you could just take a moment to um, give us some feedback. There is also an opportunity to uh, work with us um, as part of a community of practice for, as part of the Design for Care. Lucy and Brad are both on as COP members. It's an opportunity for you to um, co-design and ensure that this research is tailored for the industry and the resources that we make, that we produce and co-design together is, is useful and scalable uh, across the sector. So um, there's an EOI as part of the evaluation, so we look forward to getting your interest if you are. That's all from us, and I think you can all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you.